Okay. We are uh, straight at one o'clock in, uh, in our local time. So we're interested to get started on our higher education marketing webinar. So we just simply say hello and welcome. Uh, today we're going to talk about measuring and optimizing your school's search ad campaigns. This is brought to you by Higher Education Marketing. And if you're new to HEM, we're a digital marketing company that focuses on serving schools. And we serve schools of all types, um, higher education, K-12, sixth form, uh, uh, community college, career college, language school really any type of school, but specializing in the education sector and serving schools worldwide in multiple languages. Uh, I'm one of your hosts. My name is Scott Cross, and I'm the, the North American Regional Manager for HEM. I'm joined by uh, Archie Pollock, who is Regional Manager uh, with UK and Europe. Good morning, Archie, or good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. And we're very happy to be joined by an uh, expert on our team, uh, Alex Nahai. He is our Manager of Search and Analysis at HEM. Hi, Alex. Hey, happy to be here as well. Awesome. So we're going to have your microphones on mute for the 30 minutes we go here. We apologize for that, but that'll allow us to take care of, um, cover a lot of ground. And uh, then we're going to answer your questions. And we have Alex, of course, who's a specialist in um, search ads. So we have we have brought him so he can really answer those deeper, tougher questions. So during the webinar, please type in your questions. Uh, just go to the questions bar in your GoToWebinar menu bar there. Type it in as they pop in your head, and we'll have them ready then at the end when we go to uh, the Q&A session. Um, Everyone who registered for the webinar will receive a recording of today's webinar as well as the deck. So you'll get that in your email in the next few days. And I think um, we're ready to uh, get get rolling here. Um, today we're gonna we're gonna run in a different kind of format than we typically do in our webinars. You know, Archie and I will walk through some of the basics. We're gonna define some terms that are commonly used in measurement and optimization, so you're familiar with that. And uh, and actually kind of, you know, pretty soon after that, once we get through the, the basics, we're gonna bring Alex in right away to answer some commonly asked questions. So Archie and I will ask him those questions and then we will open it up to your questions so that you can uh, fire away from there. So here we go. Yeah, let's kick off, Scott. I think, um, like you say, it's, it makes sense at this point to just go over some of the measurement terms that people would commonly come across when they're doing these kinds of campaigns and many people who are attending may well be very familiar with these points but I think it's good to clarify uh, clarify them before uh, we move on just so that those who do already know about them can kind of reaffirm uh, their thoughts and those who maybe aren't so familiar with these kinds of activities uh, get a bit more knowledge a bit more background before we dive deeper uh, and as you can see on the screen here there's a few terms um, worth explaining. So we have impressions, which is each time your ad is served or made visible uh, in a search results page. There's interactions, which is kind of a collective term because there's different ways in which people can interact with the ad, whether it's clicking on a, a video or starting a video or swiping the ad or clicking to call and so on. So there's different ways that you can interact with the ad. And then we have the conversion, which is uh, when somebody takes the action that you're hoping that they will through uh, through the advertisement, so maybe they click learn more or inquire now or download a brochure or whatever the specific call to action might be, that we would normally count that as a conversion. And if we look at, uh, there's a few more. Let's see, we have the CTR. So the CTR is the number of people who click on the ad based on all those who saw it. So we talked about impressions earlier. It's the percentage of people who actually click through to your ad, having seen it in the search results. And then we have cost per click, which is a calculation. It's the amount of the media spend or advertising budget spent over a defined period. And then that's divided by the number of people who have clicked on the ad within that same period. So that gives us a figure, which is the average CPC. And then looking at the conversion rate, this is the percentage of people who went from the ad, from seeing the ad through to the landing page and um, then taking a, a, con a conversion or taking action. So 
Lastly, we've got cost per conversion, which is quite similar to the CPC, cost per click, but it's the, the same uh, theory in terms of calculating against the budget spent and the number of conversions that were received. And now we're going to look at some of the uh, the terms that are involved in the actual ad placement uh, when you when you get into Google Ads. So, what you're looking at here is uh, just a screen grab from within Google Ads, and we've gone into settings and campaign settings. You see there in the menu on the left, the the three ones that that really kind of stand out as a little different are well, language not so different, but just to clarify, this defines which browsers your ads are visible in. And if you see it listed twice, so you've got an English and a French, that means it'll appear in browsers that are set to English and also browsers that are set to French. Um, ad schedule, it, you can determine when your ads are visible. And typically we recommend you just keep it at all day. There are very few instances where you may not want your ad to be visible in overnight hours. Um, th this, this is where that would be. Um, noted, but pretty much we, we keep them to all day. Uh, when it comes to devices, now that's simply defining, is this going to be visible on a tablet, on a, on a mobile phone, on a desktop? And again, the only time we tweak this at all or change it is if we see that um, ads are being visible and clicked on from TVs sometimes, and typically that's not an ad that's going to drive a conversion. And right now, in terms of Google ads, we're talking search ads. These are typically ads that are lead generation or conversion driven. So we might choose to, to um, remove TV from devices. And then we also wanted to show you your options in setting up your ad. So of course, there's the ad headline, there's the ad copy. Underneath it, you have the option to list extensions. Uh, these are simply, basically, well, extensions of your of your ad, and they can engage your audience in two ways. You could uh, send them to specific pages on your website, the admissions page or the contact us page, for example. Um, or you could have every one of those links go to a landing page, which we're about to show you in a minute, including the the, the you know ad link itself. Uh, it just gives you a little more um, real estate, if you will, uh, visibility in the ad world, uh, and also allows you to, to do a few more specific listings in your ad. Now, another option here is called the, the structured snippet. Structured snippets are like extensions, but they're added to your ad text, see at the bottom there, uh, basically as a call out, and this helps to improve performance. Now you can manually control what these say, or these can be set to be automatically generated by Google based on the, the terms that you enter into your text of your ads and also the search terms. So it basically gives you a chance to highlight maybe a key point of difference uh, above and beyond your core ad copy. Thanks, Scott. I think uh, at this point, it's, we can then ask, you know, when somebody sees the ad uh, and they, let's say, they click or they tap on that ad, what happens next? You know, where do they go? Uh, and it's a question we get a lot, um, whether there's whether the, the, the ad should go to perhaps a course page or a program page or somewhere else, or whether they should go to a dedicated landing page. And a landing page is a, is a general term for where the ad goes to, but we always suggest at HEM to use dedicated landing pages, which are, let's say, program or course or very brand specific, um, because it generally uh, brings with it better results. And if we're looking at a landing page example, you've got one on screen here. This is for a school, a marketing school. And as you can see, there's a few elements that are worth pointing out. So in the top left of the screenshot, you can see that there's a school brand. And you may be familiar with that kind of um, image appearing on, on your home page of your website. When people click on it, anyone on the website, they'll go back to the home page in most cases. But a, a, a dedicated landing page, that's different. We don't want people to navigate away from this page. What we want them to do is clearly fill in this form on the right-hand side. So in order to do that, we have to give them a very straightforward message, keep it clear and simple and direct them to fill out this form as a sensible next step. So in this case, it's to get more information 
Uh, it could be to download a brochure. It could be for, uh, it could be a multitude of different calls to action. So as we scroll down that page, you'll see, reiterate the point on making the copy very simple. Bullet points are helpful, some helpful graphics perhaps. And then there's another couple of calls to action here which direct people back to the top of the page or back to filling out the form essentially. Uh, so as you can see, we're clearly driving people towards taking this next step. Um, and we're trying not to have people distracted or look around or basically disappear into the ether or evaporate their interest in a sense. And to prevent that, we also have no links to the email or social media accounts, which you can normally you would find in a, on a website, you'd find these quite often at the bottom of the website, links to the Facebook, links to Instagram, and so on. So that's really um, that's really what we want to get across this point of landing pages. And often people say, uh, you know, well, I get the idea of the landing page, the dedicated landing page, but I feel it's a bit salesy. And whilst you know, I can understand that point. Essentially, what you're trying to do here uh, when you're running these kinds of campaigns is you are trying to help people take that next step. You're really trying to make it as easy as possible in terms of user experience. If they are interested in finding out more information or inquiring with you, then you want to make it as easy as possible for them to do that. Yeah, and we, we so often have these conversations with schools, Archie, where they say, well, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be great if they went to my website? What if I had a link at the bottom just in case they wanted to go see my website? I think that would be helpful for them. Um, and although it is helpful for the user, it you know by, by designing this landing page for lead generation, we're strategically choosing not to allow them to click anywhere because our goal is to capture their contact information and, and send it directly to the school. So yeah, they they want to help and, and they they do fear that salesy element but this is where salesy you you kind of need to be specifically promoting your your offering that's a good point scott and really if you think about it in a search campaign people are searching for keywords and they'll type in those keywords and they'll you'll come up with an ad that's hopefully very relevant to them and on that dedicated landing page you're going to have enough relevant information um, for them to want to take a further action. So that's really the, the point of it. So it shouldn't really be an issue, um, the idea of going to the website. If they really, really, really want to go to the website, well, they can just type in the name of the school and I'm sure they'll find it in no time. Exactly. So yeah. we're just trying to make it as easy as possible, like we said, to, to take that next step. And yeah. I, the next step to that is what, when they fill in the form, then what happens? What you know? Do they get some kind of acknowledgement or do, you know, does it go back, does it redirect them somewhere else? Or really what we would normally suggest is building a thank you page and having a thank you page which recognizes that the person has submitted their information so that they know. And quite often you want to, at this point, also set the expectations to say, thanks for your inquiry. Someone will be in touch within the next 24 hours or we'll reach out to you soon or et cetera, et cetera, depending on your, your follow-up techniques. Um, and there's also some further calls to action there to engage further with the with the school at this point. So you have you don't mind having a few distractions and a few links uh, elsewhere at this point because really the action has been taken. And what's also very helpful for our thank you pages, if you're tracking goals on your website, then the thank you page can be very helpful. Do you maybe want to talk a bit about tracking there, Scott? Exactly, because uh, by sending them to this unique separate URL of a thank you page, that allows us to really specifically track the the conversions on that ad campaign. So we're going to show you how that's done. So you go into Google Ads, uh, and just in that first frame, you're going to go to the right, the top right where you see the wrench, tools and settings, choose measurement and conversions. And when you choose conversions, it'll open up the window that'll basically say, do you want to add a new conversion with that little plus in the blue circle? So click on that blue circle and it'll ask you what type of a conversion do you want to start to track? In this case, we want to track them going to a new website. In this case, it's really just that thank you page. Every time someone goes to that thank you page, it'll 
date, it'll count as one. And that is one person who has filled out the form completely. And keep in mind that thank you page is not on your sitemap of your website. So there's no other way someone can browse to it or click to it in any way. The only way you can access the thank you page is by filling out the form on that landing page. And therefore, when you click on website, it basically is gonna ask you, you know, what web page do you wanna measure? And you drop in the URL that we saw on the prior screen. That is that uh, thank you page URL, and you're able to define some details about it. Um, but it's that simple, really, to be able to then understand, well, if, if that page showed 20 times in the past month, then I got 20 leads. I got 20 people filling out that form. Yeah, and I think um, for those of you who have dabbled in ads at some point or are currently dabbling, then you may have come across something uh, that I want to touch on lately, which is called the Ad Quality Score. So just to talk about this, because I don't want to ignore it, um, but you'll find as you progress along your journey of, of advertisements that it will become less and less important to you uh, in, in, the, in what it means. But just to, to acknowledge it, the quality score is a factor to give you a, a ballpark idea of the strength, the quality of the ad that you, you've launched. So it's kind of a rough indication of whether the ad will do well or not, but it's not always indicative um, of success. In the beginning, however, like I said, if you're dabbling, if you're trying to get a, a, a feel for how things are working, the quality score could be uh, a useful tool. And if we're talking about how it's worked out, if we work from right to left on the screen here, you can see the quality score is used in combination with your maximum bid that you've set to create your ad rank, and the ad rank is where your ad is positioned amongst the competition. So there's different things that affect the quality score. It can be historical engagement, the quality of the landing page, the engagement of the landing page, and of course, um, re previous relevance to the search that's been conducted. But as I said, you know, take into account, this is a very basic tool. It's not always representative of how likely uh, an ad is going to be successful. And it goes to say something about Google's automated offerings as well, which are coming along somewhat, but may still leave a little bit to be desired. I don't know if anyone has anything to add to that, but I just wanted to touch on that lightly. Uh, well, that's a great point. I think it's a good time to bring in Alex and, and say, you know, toward what you just said, Archie, about Google's automations. When do Google's automations, Alex, uh, when are they most useful and when are they a little less useful? Mm -hmm. So I guess a lot of uh, Google likes to automate things for, for users. So it wants you to have, you know, in, in their version, it's like as easy as possible, set up your ads to reach as many people as possible. And so oftentimes they are actually very useful. You know, it takes care of a lot of the more technical matters for particularly uh, newcomers to, um, to Google ads and all that. But I guess uh, the problem is, is that sometimes too much is too much. Uh, and so if you're not paying, say, close attention to your ad performance, you know, seeing how every change you roll out might affect your ads. If you pretty much just, you know, accept all of the recommendations, get that quality score way up, you might actually realize that you're actually negatively impacting the performance of your ads, depending on your campaign structure. So, for instance, a, a funny anecdote. Recently, we had a call with a, a client and we pointed out that in this case, you know, two best performing ads uh, for that particular account happen to have the lowest quality score because us, uh, you know, managing the ads daily, we knew that some of the things that Google was suggesting, uh, while they might be, you know, apply to a lot of campaigns that would help them and you knew these specific ones, that wouldn't be the case. So uh, eventually what happens is that the more experienced you become, the less you rely on things like the automation, the quality score, or you know when you should rely on them, when not to rely on them. Because again, as Archie said, these are really just sort of ballpark, trying to fit as many campaigns as possible. So maybe it'll it'll benefit most campaigns, but, but not all, it's the important takeaway. Cool, that's Excellent. very helpful, thanks. Um, it is poll time. As you know, during our uh, webinars, we often poll the audience. And today we want to ask you guys, just based on what we've covered so far, and then we're going to go from here into more Q&A, kind of open form. Um, are your Google Ads set with landing pages, thank you pages, and conversion tracking? So you get the opportunity here to click and vote on your behalf. Uh, this is um, anonymous, so we're not going to uh, call you out. We're just going to kind of look at the whole audience and see where y'all fall. Um, this not only helps us to understand, but gives you an idea of where where you are 
uh, among your peers. And I think we have all our results, so here we go. Hmm. Yeah, a lot of sometimes. And that's I was I was to be honest expecting a few no's, but that's that's quite interesting. <laughs> I certainly understand the sometimes it's the kind of thing you try to do and really work to and, and often becomes just I run out of time right because um, or maybe resources to build a landing page I get it yeah but that's yeah uh, or sometimes it's you know it's two two out of three are in place and there's just one one piece of the puzzle missing possibly but yeah that's right just... yeah okay so we're gonna hop back into our our session here and uh, and now formally introduce uh, Alex, glad, glad to have you here. What we're gonna do is begin with kind of a, a quick common question round where we're gonna ask the, the questions Archie and I hear all the time and we'll get Alex's answer, answers. First one is how often should I check the measurement or performance of my Google search campaign? Uh, so in this case, it depends, but um, I guess the, the way it depends is how long has your campaign been running. So if it's been a recently launched campaign, then we would definitely recommend every day versus something that you've had up and running and optimized, which we would probably say every week. And, and so the reason for that is that new campaigns, when you launch them right off the bat, um, there's a lot of data coming in. These are really like the key moments to, to optimize it to cut out parts that aren't working, to give little boosts the bits that are, to check your traffic, to make sure the right users are showing up, uh, make sure your budget's spending properly, you know, really just to double check everything that you had planned before to make sure it's working uh, the way you want. And if it's not, this is the perfect time to tweak it because you don't want to let it run for a week without checking. And it turns out that you're attracting all the wrong kinds of uh, prospects the whole time. But after it's been optimized, usually you can get them to a place where you just want to check them uh, maybe once a week, you know, make sure the budget's fine, there's nothing odd going on uh, and so forth. Okay, thanks Alex. Um, and a, a second question would be, uh, so how should I set the period of time I measure? There's obviously a lot of different parameters uh, that can be set for Google Ads in terms of understanding performance over a certain period of time. Do you have any kind of standard uh, protocol about time periods for measurement? Yeah, usually our, our go-to, particularly also for new campaigns, is that when you set, you know, the time period under review, we just view month to date. Uh, so that's sort of one of the reasons for that is it gives you, uh, you know, a benchmark since the start of the month, because often reporting uh, is, you know, the end of the month or the first of the month are sort of uh, times where the budget's reset, where reporting goes out, where you, you take stock of things. And you're usually comparing this start of the month to, say, last start of the month as well. So you can really see how uh, how things are performing there. Um, this is this is really good too for new campaigns because obviously there won't be any past data to check. Uh, but for ones that have been there longer, you might want to you know, say like you've you've done your regular optimizations and you still know something's wrong. You would probably take a larger period of time to look at more data. And sometimes surprising things happen there. Like a keyword performing great just this month might have been terrible last month or vice versa. Uh, so it's usually good to then check uh, the previous uh, some of the previous data as well. It kind of gets me thinking, Alex, I mean, just in our experience this year, in 2022, it seems to me, maybe it's just my point of view, each month has performed a little differently. Some months are hot and busy and driving great uh, data, and other months are quite quiet. Mm -hmm. It's definitely been a, an interesting and a bit of an odd uh, year so far compared to past years. I guess, I mean, this is partially ending of the pandemic, lifting restrictions. A lot of factors are changing uh, from where they were, and it's almost like some months uh, are just better than others, but you know, across the board, which is interesting that there's uh, some unexpected trends going on out here. Yeah, that, that just helps to understand it. It doesn't always trend up, 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 up a little. Yeah, I think, I think that also depends on the, the, the subsect of education as well. I think some of our yes. friends who are with us today, maybe from universities or business schools, uh, may have been less affected than, let's say, those of, who are joining today from language schools who've had a really rough couple of years, but are starting to see, you know, a surge in popularity with hopefully things, you know, progressing uh, and opening up to what they might have been before. So uh, yeah, it could also, you know, there's also other factors to look at as well. I guess. Absolutely, that's a great point. That's a great point. Uh, another common question we have: uh, Which reports and metrics should I check first or initially when I'm checking campaigns? Can you share that with us, Alex? Yeah, the first one we would always recommend checking is uh, going to the campaigns report or the campaign screen. 
And this basically shows all of your campaigns that you have running at a glance with all the main metrics. Um, so for instance, all the metrics that Scott and Archie talked about earlier, you know, impressions, clicks, click, click through, that's all there. But probably more importantly, you're also the conversion related ones. So how many conversions, so how many students showed interest, uh, how much does it cost to get each of these conversions, what the rate of conversions are. Uh, so this is really good for sort of like initial triage when you're investigating your campaign. So say you launched a whole bunch this week, you'd come here and you could pretty much see at a glance which ones are doing well, which ones aren't. Because obviously if there's no conversions and a lot of money spent, that's not ideal. Or if you get some conversions, but they're way too expensive, that's not ideal either. And so you would kind of take stock here, then decide which campaign you might want to drill down to a bit further to start. Uh, maybe some more triage or maybe some optimization at this point. So normally say if there's a campaign it's not performing as expected. We would sort of click on it here and then take us to the next level uh, report, which is the ad groups uh, report, which is one level lower than this. And so the ad groups report uh, also contains much of the same information as the last one, but this is inside the campaign itself. So most campaigns have multiple ad groups and each ad group could be a set of interests or a set of keywords that you could group together based on similarities. And so you do the same thing here. Do you look for some that maybe spent a little too much, cost a little too much for your conversions? Uh, you know, you can take some, uh, some overall views here. Maybe you might want to just raise the bid on an ad group that's bringing in lots of conversions so you capture a bit more of that audience. Maybe you'll lower the bid entirely for ones that just don't seem to be delivering what you want. But again, you can go even deeper here as well uh, down to the keyword level, which the keywords are pretty much nestled inside all the ad groups. And so sometimes you need to get this far down this granular to really see where a problem could be so you might see a whole bunch of like well-performing keywords here but then one that's just soaking up lots of the budget because that's too much interest and maybe the interest is off topic that these people aren't actually looking for what you're offering They're looking for something else it could be a synonym for the same word or it could just be that people searching for this particular keyword just aren't in the mood to you know take that next step so this is where you would then go you might pause the keyword if it's performed you know, poorly for consecutive weeks or months, maybe just reduce the bid. You can up the bid on the ones that are performing well to try to capture more of those uh, those users as well in the process. So that's normally sort of like the basic run through we would do, start the campaigns, assess, go a bit deeper, assess the ad groups, and then get down to the keywords. And usually you'll be able to find like, you know, nine out of 10 of the problems of a campaign is not performing well just by doing this basic sort of uh, triage here. Cool. And I, I just want to note, I don't see any questions in the question box yet for the webinar. I'm guessing what you just said could prompt a few, so please feel free to type in your questions. Um, and then lastly, before we get to kind of Q&A period, um, you just had some kind of just core, we, we call them best practices, but generally the, the four core things you would look to, to make sure we do as we uh, measure our ads. Can you talk to these four points, please? Yeah, so here are sort of four useful things if you're running campaigns on your own or just getting started. So the first one is don't mix search and display campaigns together. And so what this is, Google basically has two different types of offerings. One would be search campaign. So people typing things into the Google search bar, having the ad pop up there in text. And display are ones that are the images you'll see on the side of like websites or newspaper websites with pictures that you then click and go to the page. So by default, Google kind of encourages people to group them, but we would say, actually, don't do that. Stick with one or the other. And the reason it's easier to maintain and manage if they're separate, you can have separate budgets for them, separate performance, so you don't have to crawl in and then go really deep to try to differentiate one from the other. And usually also search and display serve different purposes. So search ads, people are already in sort of the market mindset. They're looking for a degree, you know, if they're searching for best NBA degree, you know, in France, they're probably actually curious about this. Or display, they might just have it to be reading, you know, uh, a website. So it's a bit more branding and, or awareness related in that sense. So we recommend splitting them. Uh, the second thing is, so Google likes optimize, not optimization, but <laughs> likes that too, but automation. So it really, <laughs> nowadays, when you're creating campaigns, it really tries to automate most of the process for you. Usually us uh, at the agency, we, we kind of follow the automation, but then right after we immediately tweak it the way we want to set it up. Um, and so you, right now there's a lot of settings for what sort of your campaign goal is, or your bid strategy. Uh, a couple of them, they're listed, you know, there's maximize clicks, maximize impressions, things like that, but really maximize conversions. This should be the default. 
if that's what you want to do. If you want to like Google handle a bit of this automatically because it'll aim to give you, I guess, prospects who are most likely to fill out that form, who are most likely interested in the programs you're offering and most likely interested in, you know, taking that next step towards becoming students. Or say just clicks is just getting people to go there regardless if they're sort of in that, um, you know, demographic. Uh, but in the case of our hands, <clears throat> and if you're a bit more experienced as well, we would recommend at least definitely in the early stages of your campaign, sending it back to manual CPC where you manually set the bids for everything. So it gives you a lot more control, uh, especially right off the bat. And once things get a bit more healthy, you can switch back to maximize conversions. Because uh, often also those automations from Google take a little while to get warmed up. Like you might not have good results for a few weeks while the machine learning kind of figures out what it's doing, but you can give it a hand by manually, you know, managing the campaign itself. Uh, and the last thing is one of the, the most recurring types of optimization is that you want to go block irrelevant search terms. So what this is, is that you can actually see what people are searching that triggers your ads. Um, and a lot of the times, especially early in the campaign, you're gonna see a lot of sort of irrelevant searches popping in there. Like it might be something, you know, say it's an art course you're doing, you might say art course for kids, but you only offer for adults. You might see things about, you know, textbooks or PDFs that have nothing to do with, with your institution. Uh, even sometimes like synonyms get weird. Say if you have a public relations communication course, people might be searching PR for permanent residency. So you wanna really see what people are typing in there and block any sort of terms that you don't think are relevant uh, to what your offering is, because you might be surprised at what you see, what people are, are searching for and how it actually leads to your ads when they have, they're not even looking for a, you know, a college degree or anything like that. So that, that's something that is really important in the early days, but also you want to do weekly as well. Check what people are searching to find your ads and make sure they're actually searching for the right, uh, you know, intent, the right intent, the right uh, words and all that. Great, great. I think that takes us from from common questions to kind of in depth, eh, Archie? <laughs> yeah, I think so. No, absolutely, and it, it is good to dig that little bit deeper, especially for those of you out there who are, you know, have, who have worked a bit with ads already and uh, are looking to kind of uh, go beyond scratching the surface and getting to to understand some of the. Well, I guess they are they're still very much FAQs um, that we get, but some of them, of course, more detailed than others. Yes, indeed. Um, so let's go to the questions. Uh, see anything in the questions box there? Let's see. <clears throat> uh, so Google versus Bing, the difference. It's a very, it's a quite, quite a vague, yeah. vague statement, but I guess we'll go yeah, with I it. probably answer that pretty quickly. So the main difference is they're different search engines. So one's on Google's, the other one is on the Microsoft search engine. Usually people using uh, Bing slash Microsoft ads uh, are generally people in North America, particularly the United States, where a lot of people still use Edge or even older Internet Explorer and things like that. So it's just different. So anything, any ad in Google ads will not appear in the, the Microsoft environment and vice versa. But using the platforms are basically identical. Microsoft uh, completely based theirs off Google for compatibility as well. So you can import ads from Google to Microsoft and back and forth. So they're functionally basically the same it's just going to target different audiences and in the case of bing from our experience we don't see very many people using uh, that search engine outside of north america it's almost non-existent uh, elsewhere yeah that's interesting because you know uh, many of many of the, the clients we work with um, in the uk and, and europe and beyond uh, don't really use bing themselves and do wonder you know is it something I should be using as a platform or should I just leave it be? But especially if you're looking to target potentially bringing students over from North America, it could be, you know, well worth experimenting with Bing and, and, and delving mm -hmm. into it just to see how it goes because it might seem a bit alien to us on this side of the Atlantic, but uh, it certainly is, it does have a, a, a relevant portion of usership uh, in North mm -hmm. America. Yep. Uh, another question in, in Google, Specifically, we have cases where folks want to launch remarketing campaigns um, or re retargeting campaigns. What are the kind of thresholds that you need in within you know response to the initial campaign before you initiate a, a retargeting campaign? 
Mm -hmm. So you can start a targeting campaign, you know, immediately provided you've already had the infrastructure in place for it. So you need to have had some tracking to, to gather numbers of visitors on specific pages. Uh, so I guess go one step back. The way you would set, we usually set it up. So say if you want to remarket to an MBA program, we would find all the visitors that went to either an MBA landing page or an MBA program page or any irrelevant MBA information on your site. Uh, then exclude anybody who's actually filled out forms or become a student. So all these people that visited but never took an action are the ones we would then retarget. And so oftentimes we do only start these, you know, maybe a month or two after ads have been up because we don't have the data. But if you've had, you know, Google Analytics on your website for a substantial period of time, you can see you have thousands of people in this group. We can, you know, pretty much immediately create uh, ads to target them. Otherwise, you need to take, I think it was like a hundred or a thousand, forget the exact number, over a certain period of time before they, they functions properly. Okay, good to know. So we're basically putting an ad back in front of someone who expressed a little bit of interest but didn't mm -hmm. quite uh, complete the, the form or whatever engagement. Yeah, yet. it's kind of give them the final nudge to go back and fill in their information to learn more about the program they hopefully want to uh, register in. Awesome. Okay, um, we we'll get time for one more. We just want to be respectful of everyone's time as well. Um, uh, so how can I calculate how much I should be spending on search ads? I guess this is a bit of a chicken and egg scenario to some degree. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'd say it's, it's a fair question though. So, I mean, depending on the size of your school, that's probably the size of your budget as well as well as how much area you're targeting. Uh, generally, we don't recommend the smallest imaginable campaign would be like say 300 bucks a month uh, in a very small geographic region because other than that, you'll be spread too thin and you won't get enough data to optimize effectively. So say you're you know, targeting all of the United States for 300 bucks, you might get a click in this state, a click in that state, a bunch in here, but you won't really have enough to understand where the, the best you know, places to target are. It would take a, long, a lot of data before you can get there. So generally, you know, over a thousand is, is a better amount because you get a lot more clicks, a lot more data. Uh, but if you can go higher, you can go higher because effectively the faster and the more data you get, the better you can optimize because it, you know the sampling will be more accurate. If you get it, one conversion from Missouri, is that part of a trend or, or an oddity? If you don't have enough budget and enough clicks, you really can't mm -hmm. tell until maybe a few months down the line. Here's a question that just popped in real quickly. How often should the ad content be refreshed? Um, so really depends on a lot of things. I mean, if any time there's an update with your program, uh, that's something you would definitely want to do. If there's details that have changed, if registration dates are in there have changed. Uh, otherwise, usually we would, if there's nothing, you know, time period specific that might run out, we'd recommend keeping it there as long as it's working. And if it stops working, then it's probably a good time to test some new ad copy. But if you're getting steady conversions on, you know, ad text from four months ago, keep it keep it running because it's clearly working excellent okay so if it's not if it's not broken don't fix it essentially yeah pretty much <laughs> okay makes sense okay well thanks everyone for attending today just a, a, a final couple of things to say um if you are feeling a bit uh in the jungle with all of this um hopefully today has helped to make things a bit clearer and maybe answer some of your initial questions um, but if you'd still like to talk about it or you'd like to look at your situation in more detail, you can simply uh, click yes, please, and we'll reach out to you and, uh, and organize um, a review of the ads that you've been running or just a, a call to talk about some of the things we've mentioned today and how you might want to proceed. Uh, so all of these calls are always no obligation and we'd be delighted to just to chat and have a feel for how things are going at your school. Um, feel free just to click yes. and. Uh, and we'll be in touch. Um, so any answer you give will be anonymous, just so you know it's not going to pop up yes or no or, or your name or anything like that. Uh, there's my contact details. I'll be more or less in your time zone. Uh, always happy to, to speak to you and uh, very easy to reach. So anything else to, to add, gents, before we sign off? No, I think we've uh, we covered a whole lot of bases. We appreciate you all spending this time with us today. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, Alex, also for your expertise, and uh, we'll see everyone else uh, next month.